Funding for Current Conversations is provided by University of Oklahoma President's Office, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano, and today we're talking with Dr. Joshua Landis, Director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. We're going to be discussing the latest developments in Syria and the Middle East. Joshua, I wanted to ask you first about the al-Assad regime. I think most of us thought they would be gone by now. They were supposed to be out of power and they're persisting, they're still there. Could you give us a kind of status report of uh, that Syrian regime? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, everybody predicted that they'd be gone within months and so forth. And of course, their predictions were wrong. And now they've, they've written all these red lines that they've been long since gone. Which is and embarrassing for us. It's embarrassing for everybody yeah. because everybody thought that they could just go boo and the regime would fall down. Turkey thought that, Saudi Arabia, all kinds of people said sorts of things that they now can't live up to. And the Assad regime did get very weak in that first year, but then it's been building itself back. It restructured its army um, and has built a national defense force that Iran has helped with a lot. Hezbollah stepped in and helped them incredibly. So their allies, and Iraq too, a Shiite dominated country, um, their allies have kicked in and Russia have helped rebuild this army They've gotten better at fighting, and they've begun to push back the rebels, but they're still too weak to win the whole country. To really take on ISIS. To they take on do. ISIS yeah. and many of the other militias. We've had a stalemate for the last two years. The regime has been getting a little bit tougher, but it, to take all the rest of Syria, very difficult to do. Do you think uh, Assad's strategy at this point is just to wait out the opposition, just exist, survive long enough? and the pressure at some point will be lifted and he'll just go on? Yes, I think he, he, he sees that the opposition is becoming more and more Islamist, more virulent, and that's playing into his hands. Mm -hmm. Already, the United States has stepped in to bomb ISIS, which owns 35% of Syrian territory, mm -hmm. and uh, Al-Qaeda, which owns another 5, 6, 7% of Syrian territory. So his two most lethal enemies amongst the rebels, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, are being bombed by America. The two countries are now, in a sense, strategic allies. Of course, America... I Iran and Syria. No, uh, United States <laughs> and Syria. Okay. Uh, Iran and, and, and Syria are allies. They've been allies from the beginning. But the United States is bombing Assad's two most dangerous enemies. And that's good for him. It's taken some pressure off him. So, of course, the United States wants nothing to do with this tyrannical regime. It's not coordinating in any way with him, and they insist on this every few days. But they're killing his enemy. So, and the Assad regime is the one in Deir ez and a number of places around ISIS that is, in some areas, mm -hmm. most likely to take ISIS territory if it's weakened enough. Is it possible that the U.S. doesn't want Assad to be out of power at this point? It, the, things are too chaotic. There's not an opposition insurgent group really to turn to at this point. Well, it's that's either. the big unspoken yeah. in all of this, is that the United States sees Assad as a bulwark against these extremist movements mm -hmm. and against ISIS. Because should Assad fall and the Syrian army collapse tomorrow, who's going to take Damascus? Mm -hmm. It's going to be ISIS. It's going to be uh, Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And that would be a disaster for America new wave of millions of refugees would probably flood out of Syria, going to Lebanon and Jordan. It could cause those countries to collapse. So the U.S. does not want Assad to fall. They're not saying it, but you can see it everywhere because Turkey, Saudi Arabia have said, we've got to destroy Assad. If we're going to bomb ISIS, we've got to bomb Assad as well. Mm -hmm. And the United States is saying, no, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been uh, a source of great rancor between Turkey and the United States, between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Now, you mentioned Iran. Uh, it seems to me that they're the sort of mysterious player at this, in, at this juncture. Why are they so loyal to Assad? I mean, they're, they're Shiites, Alawites are kind of, off, they have a relationship with Shiites. Why the, the loyalty? I mean, couldn't this end up being very embarrassing for Iran later and very awkward if Assad does fall? 
Well, it, it, it would be a great loss for Iran. The, the sources are about three. One, as you've mentioned already, is that the Iranian Revolution took place and said, we've got a model. And Iran has taken its place as the head of Shiites worldwide. And about 15%, about maybe 20% of all Muslims are Shiite. Mm -hmm. So Iran is their defenders. Now, Alawites are heterodox Shiites. They're quite different from Shiites. But there's a Shiites in Lebanon and Hezbollah. All the arms that get to Hezbollah get there through Syria. So mm -hmm. if Syria would fall off as an ally of Iran, Hezbollah would be quickly mm -hmm. cut down, cut to pieces. And they would lose this large reach. Iran believes that if it loses these Shiite allies, mm -hmm. it could be invaded by the United States or attacked by the United States in the same way that the United States tried to overturn the regime at, after 1979 revolution. We uh, helped Saddam Hussein in his invasion of Iran, in which he almost destroyed the Iranian revolution. We were giving intelligence. We were funneling arms to the Saudis. We were giving money to Iraq. So Iran sees this as America's trying to destroy them. Mm -hmm. And there, Assad, reached over, the father, Assad, reached over and allied himself with Iran around, uh, against a common enemy, Baghdad. So Syria is its oldest ally, stood only Arab country that really stood by Iran mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. this period. It's Shiite government, and it's an important conduit to Hezbollah in Lebanon. So for all those reasons, reasons Iran believes they cannot allow Assad to be swept aside. There, there seem to be hints, too, that Iran could play a larger role. when. Uh, the United States first started the air campaign against ISIS. Iran made a real strong point about, well, this is not going to be enough. You're going to need other actors. This can't really win. And then they did some bombing themselves, I think, of ISIS maybe about two weeks ago. Um, I mean, are they a potential partner on the ground with us if we could get over the nuclear issue? And, and I mean, they're a military that would be formidable against ISIS, right? Look, it, both Assad and the Iranian regime, both Shiite powers, see ISIS, which is a Sunni, very sectarian group, right. as a common enemy. We are trying to destroy them. It's quite clear that there is an alliance waiting to happen mm -hmm. with America allying with the Shiites against the Sunnis. Right. That would be a deadly trap for America. That's what Americans believe what Washington believes, because their allies, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries, Qatar, and so forth, as well as Turkey, a member of NATO, are Sunni powers. They do not want to see these Sunnis harmed in favor of the Shiites, mm -hmm. the Assad regime, the uh, regime in Iraq, and of course, Iran. So America has to balance in some way. And the way, even though these are natural allies in a fight against ISIS, right. they cannot formally ally with them because they would be undermining their own long f friendships. But isn't there a development possible somewhere in the near future? Maybe the, the point at which we got in World War II where the Third Reich was just so powerful, all bets were off, we just got to join together and take them on. Couldn't ISIS get to that point where all bets are off and people say it's time to stop them, whatever it takes? Well, a lot of people have, have mentioned this. And the, the thing that's different here about Hitler and ISIS is that ISIS in Washington still today, even though a few American heads have been chopped off, does not see ISIS as an existential threat the way Hitler was. ISIS, they believe, can be contained. They're going to help the Iraqi, I mean, Obama believes that he can help the Iraqi army rebuild over a few years, reconquer, shove ISIS out of Iraq. That will put it into Syria. We don't have a natural ally in Syria because we're not associating with the Assad regime, which is tyrannical and brutal. Mm -hmm. And the Sunni militias have crumbled and are very fragmented. So we're going to try to contain them in Syria. And we are only doing this air campaign. We've said no boots on the ground. We're talking about building and arming and equipping and training a Syrian army made of refugee rebels. But I don't think anybody takes that very seriously. We've earmarked about half a billion dollars for that. It's chump change. There, there are like 1,005 insurgent groups in Syria, right? There are over 1,000, <clears> according to the CIA, and all of them are very small and local. 
So it's like herding cats, and America has thrown their hands up, and, and they don't want to really do this. It would cost a ton. So to the try president to talked up. about uh, vetting some group that we could work with in Syria, and then I noticed the talk just stopped. Basically, we just given up on that. That's really not a uh, uh, direction that's going to go anywhere. Uh, we have given up on that to a certain degree. What's happened over the last month or so is that a big region around Idlib in the north near Turkey, which was the home to seven or eight groups that we were supplying with advanced arms and paying the salaries of these soldiers. Mm -hmm. Those groups were beaten up and driven out by Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. which saw them as a threat because of course we were arming them to kill right. the radicals. So the radicals said, well, we're not gonna wait around for America to give them all this stuff. They just went and knocked them out. And that put paid to America's strategy because these guys look very weak. Mm -hmm. and, and just a week ago, uh, a, a good journalist wrote an article about how over eight, 900 of these people who used to get American salaries are now joined Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it raised the whole question of loyalties and all this other question. Now the United States says it's going to build an army in Turkey and Saudi Arabia made up of individuals who are vetted by America and trained. Mm -hmm. It's a cacamamie idea, but it's going forward because I think, uh, you know, a lot of people want it in Washington, and, and Obama doesn't want to, he's said yes, but he's given them very little money. Displaced people, we're not hearing a whole lot about uh, folks in Syria, but we're talking really large numbers of people being displaced and beheaded and sold into sexual slavery. Would you talk about that a little bit? Well, the displacement has been terrible. Syria is a country of about 24 million people. Today, three and a half million have fled Syria altogether. But displaced inside the country are another mm. five million. Some people say as many as seven or eight million. Yeah. So we're talking a third to, you know, getting closer to a half the country has been moved around in one way or another. So the country is very unstable and uh, tons of poor people. The economy has been ha over halved. It's collapsed. Syria is under very strict economic sanctions mm -hmm. from the international community. Mm -hmm. So money can't get in. For example, I have family members in Syria, my wife's family members. We cannot send them money. We're trying to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, DHL goes to Lebanon, then you have to get somebody to carry it over. Wow. And it's, it's a misery trying to help people in the region. And, uh, and so that's, you know, but I Where guess are people that, going? They're being displaced within Syria. Are a lot leaving the country? And, and well, where? Three million have left, the, three plus million have left the country. Many people are going internally. The rebel areas have become increasingly difficult to live in because you've got a thousand groups, because the Assad regime is bombing yeah. them day and night. And so what a, tons of Sunnis have done is they fled into the regime held areas where life still has an element of normalcy, where the war has not affected many regions. The coastal cities, which are dominated by Alawites and other minorities, have become big gathering places for Sunni refugees, Tartus, Latakia, and so yeah. forth. Damascus as well has swelled with refugees because it's still government dominated. So people have gone to those government areas looking for succor. The, the one community that I think gets focused on in the media over here and it just breaks your heart, it's such terrible news, is the, are the, the Yazidis. And it seems like they're close to being destroyed as a culture. Is that accurate? Oh, that is. You know, there's about half a million, 600,000 Yazidis that lived in Senjar Mountains in mm -hmm. Iraq, northern Iraq, and in near Mosul in the plains. ISIS swept over that area. ISIS looked at them as pagans, mm -hmm. not as members of the three Abrahamic religions. Right. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. All of those religions according to Islam, have received word from God. Those in their are the books. people of the book. They're the people of the book, and yeah. they're protected. Although Jews and Christians are second-class citizens in this very fundamentalist worldview. So of ISIS, ISIS does extend that people of the book status to Jews as well? Uh, it, it, it should. It doesn't own any Jews. Yeah, yeah. There aren't any Jews where it's conquered, so we don't right. know what they, I'm sure they would find an excuse to do terrible things to them right. because of Israel and so forth. But religiously, they're included in this protected people status. Right. But pagans are not. And the Yazidis are Zoroastrian offshoots. So they're considered to be beyond the pale. And therefore there's no protection. And in fact, mm. they see it 
actually is an embarrassment that they've survived this long within an Islamic world. And so they just chased them out. And they captured perhaps five, 6,000 Yazidi women and took them into slavery and are using them as concubines. Is there any clandestine support among other Arab nations for ISIS at this point? Or has is, or is everybody pretty much said they're the problem? Everybody has said that they're a problem. How much of a problem? Very differing degrees. Now, that's the governments. The governments and most Sunni governments from the region have sent airplanes and other, uh, you know, and some arms to help America in this broader coalition. But amongst the people of the Middle East, mm -hmm. there's a big spectrum. And some people see ISIS as a champion for downtrodden Sudis who are being mm -hmm. persecuted by these two very sectarian Shiite governments in Baghdad and Damascus, mm -hmm. who are, have caught these big Sunni population in sort of a vice grips and have persecuted them. So they see ISIS as the strong man on a horse who's come, ridden in here, and is trying to champion a Sunni agenda. And a lot of people, at least in the first weeks, were taken with that narrative. Mm -hmm with the beheadings and the horrible, you know, visual world of what's going on there, most Muslims have completely turned away. Well, they've really taken over from Al-Qaeda. I mean, couldn't you even say that Baghdadi, is that how you say his yes. name, the ISIS uh, leader, is a sort of new Osama bin Laden? I mean, doesn't he have that kind of charismatic position now in that world? Uh, he does. He has, and he's in competition with Al-Qaeda. He came out against traditional al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. which tried to discipline him and keep him from being so violent. And he said, no, I am the caliph. He named himself caliph. He took on, he began to attack al-Qaeda in Syria. He beat them up badly, pushed them to the margins. Now they're rebuilding, but they, they were really fell back and many al-Qaeda members deserted al-Qaeda and joined Baghdadi. Mm -hmm. And uh, he raised violence to a whole different level and began to build a state. Now, Al-Qaeda's idea is, no, we're not going to build a state. We're going to work with these other Islamist groups mm -hmm. to try to defeat Assad, and then we'll build a state. Right. Baghdad said, no, we're not going to wait for that. We're going to build a state today. And he began, and this captured the imaginations of Muslims because it was an alternative. It was a caliphate, and he was in a rush to get there. So he looked like a utopian situation at first. Of course, it's, a you know, for... Most of the world looking on it's just a dystopia. We don't know a lot about him, do we? I mean, it seems to me there are rumors that he has a PhD in Islamic studies. And uh, do we know anything very much for sure about? Well, exactly? he does have a PhD, as far as we know, from Baghdad in Islamic studies. The, the, a turning point for him was the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. He was swept up with a lot of radicalized Islamist uh, Sunnis and put in a camp called Camp Buka, mm -hmm. which was one of our prison camps. He was held there. The, the amount of time is, is varying, but there have been some great investigative reporting about his experience there, and an experience of, in a sense, Camp Buka, as well as a number of other prison camps, became universities for Al-Qaeda. And he joined Al-Qaeda, and he became a leader pretty quickly within the camp. And, and other people who 2009, were, he gets out of prison, right? And then, well, he, well, he got out of prison before that in about 2004, five. Okay. And um, he joins Al-Qaeda in Iraq in this, as it began to mobilize and fight against America. Mm -hmm. America did the surge. We beat them down. He was always behind the scenes. Two leaders later, Al-Qaeda's had several leaders killed, and then he rose to the top. He took them over, and he paid allegiance to bin Laden and Zawahiri. When bin Laden got killed, Zawahiri in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But then he spread his power over Syria, and uh, very quickly, Zawahiri in Afghanistan or Pakistan said, you've got to stay to Iraq. We're going to have a different franchise in Syria, at which point he turned against Zawahiri. He said, no, I'm the man. You're just sitting back up there, and I'm going to build this country. And Everything you just yeah. described really was a result of the U.S. getting out of Iraq, right, and leaving kind of a power vacuum there for him and uh, a kind of rebuilt al-Qaeda in the form of ISIS to come in and fill that, uh, that empty space. Well, there's two theories on that. One is that it's his, the creation of al-Qaeda in Iraq was because America invaded, destroyed the Saddam government, and had no clue what was 
what Pandora's box that had opened, mm -hmm. and this Sunni insurgency immediately sprung up. There was no Al Qaeda before the American invasion, and it spread like a virus once America invades and destroyed the central state. The other interpretation is America left too early. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of the Republican explanation, I guess, is that Obama cut and ran, mm -hmm. and that he should have forced an agreement on the Iraqis to stay longer and to commit troops uh, in Iraq that would have killed these guys before they could get back on their feet again. So you've got you know, in a sense, you've got the Democratic criticism that Bush shouldn't have gone in, in the first place, and you've got the Republican criticism, which is Ibam, Obama was so eager to get out of Iraq that he left the job half done. Is, is Baghdadi trying to uh, sort of capture the, the alienation on the street from the street Sunnis? Oh, he, that, he's yeah. capturing it. In, in the first months, he absolutely captured that. After three and a half years, almost four years of civil war with militias taking over the town, moving out, new conquerors coming in. People were so sick and tired of not having one leadership. The lights turned on, a school system that they could go to. They, they, many people who would never embrace something like ISIS thought maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe mm -hmm. they'll provide some kind of, and they, they set up a minister of petroleum, a minister of education. They began to build a state where none of the other militias had done that. So there was a sense that this could be it. But of course, um, it was very brutal, and now America's bombing it, and uh, the situation is very chaotic, and, and nobody can see where it's headed in the future today. What's the potential that this uh, uh, ISIS movement could actually take over the Middle East? I mean, expand way beyond the uh, Syria, Iraq territory they have now? Really pose a threat to the world. Well, I think that, you know, when ISIS at first, nobody took ISIS seriously. Everybody said they're the JV League and yeah. so forth. And, and, but then when they came to the doors of Baghdad and Erbil, the Kurdistan, they, they had a real fighting force. And none of these other forces were, they were corrupt. And uh, they all melted away in the face of ISIS. So it did look like they could sweep down, perhaps take Jordan, and then threaten Saudi Arabia. So, but they were contained fairly quickly. As soon as America started bombing them with their F-16s, mm -hmm. it put them back on their heels. They don't have a lot of equipment. They don't have an air force. They are, they're a well-trained guerrilla force. Mm -hmm. But they're nothing against the Saudi army. As long as Saudi Arabia stays unified and doesn't melt from the inside, which there are no indications that it would, they're gonna hold up and these states can contain it. And I think America, and increasingly what you see from President Obama, is a containment strategy that we don't need, we can't really go to war and fix this area. We tried that under President Nation Bush. Nation building in Syria would just be too big for us, wouldn't it? I think so. And so in that sense, we talk much bigger than we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you look at the money, it's minimal, six, seven billion dollars for these airplanes to fly over, hit some targets, keep them back on their heels. But um, but no plan. You know, I, I was thinking about the criticism that the Obama administration gets for not having a really coherent policy towards the Middle East or towards Syria. But listening to you now, uh, th they must be applying the same logic, that ISIS can be contained, this won't go on forever, it won't be an existential threat to the world. Uh, let it play out for a while, see how it goes, keep up the bombing, and maybe we can bomb them back further than they think. And Well, that I think that's, I think you, you, you've nailed it. And also, what you hear from people in Washington is, we don't want to fight. We cannot destroy this. Mm -hmm. This is something that the neighborhood has to destroy. Fellow Muslims have to take on ISIS, mm -hmm. and they have to come to grips with the fact that this is it's not good for them. As long as Uncle Sam is going to spend billions to go in there and do their dirty work for them, they're going to sit on the side. They're going to be free riders on this, because why not have F-16s take, take out ISIS. What, what, what about a, let me just throw this out for a reaction. What about a, a line of thinking that would say the U.S. in some fundamental way is on the wrong side of history right now in this region? Here are these governments that are kept in power by the United States. They uh, have questionable support from their own countries. Uh, the, the radical Islam movement that uh, ISIS sort of represents now is ultimately going to win out. What would you say to that? Well, I think there are a lot of people who, who do think that way. You know, there are certainly people who support this radicalization and they hate the order that exists today. But our allies in the region 
Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Jordan, Lebanon. We don't want to see those. We don't want to see those countries fall. We can't afford to see them fall. It would be very chaotic. So if we can contain and uh, not, you know, look, for Obama, when Baghdad almost fell, if Obama had presided over Iraq falling to Al-Qaeda, it would have been a disaster. Yeah, yeah. So he couldn't let that. He had to contain it. But he doesn't know how to fix it. And nobody else in America knows how to fix it either. We've got all kinds of methods. But uh, so, so this leads us in a situation that is, I think, rather dark in the region with America containing and Syria, no center of authority in Syria. Is U.S. foreign policy uh, or U.S. policy about Syria maybe been not very helpful? Uh, we've drawn so many lines in the sand and then we weren't willing to back it up and it just looks like we're going to continue to take a pass. Doesn't that invite chaos? It does invite chaos. And, you know, America has made a fundamental mistake in the Middle East on several occasions, which is that we believe if we got rid of these terrible dictatorships, we would get democracy out the other end. That, that essentially every Arab had a liberal inside of him waiting to agree with the fellow Arabs and to yeah. produce a liberal state. That has not turned out to be the case. We see a very fragmented society, very many different opinions. Nobody talks about Arab Spring anymore. No, they don't. They talk about yeah. containment of radicalization. And, yeah. and in a sense, we did that in Iraq thinking we would get a good outcome by destroying Saddam, and we've gotten chaos. We've done that in, a, in Libya, and now we've done it in Syria. And we, we, we thought he would fall, and we could just push him overboard, and that some new, better order and what we've seen is that a worse order yeah. is looming there, ready to take over. And we don't want it to take over. So much to talk about. I am so sorry we're out of time. Well, it's a pleasure talking Thank to you. Thank you for being with us here today. And let's do another show soon. Catch up on I Syria. look forward to it. That's it for today. Please join us again next time for Current Conversations. Thank you for watching.